also like to acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Ngunnawal people. So this, this session is about hints on, hints on identifying uh, grasses. And my passion is, is more for native vegetation, but when we talk about grasses, we include both native and introduced, uh, introduced grasses. So what, why learn about grasses? Well, obviously grasses are our main source of food, uh, both directly in cereals and indirectly through grazing animals, etc. Grasses are very new, they're very numerous species. They're complex, they're diverse, which is another word for biodiversity and they're fascinating. So in learning about grasses, we can, uh, I, I suppose if we know about grasses, then we can manage pastures better. And the other thing I'd like to make a plug for is that there's a very strong emerging market about seed production of native grass seeds. So that may be something you'd like to uh, become interested in. Now, what are the hints? What I'm going to do is talk about uh, a number of different ways of looking at uh, grass plants. They are complex. And so I'm just gonna to touch on quite a lot of uh, different, different aspects of identifying grasses. So unfortunately, because we don't have much time, we won't be spending a lot of time on any one of these characteristics, but uh, I'm arranging for Alex to, uh, or for me to share the link uh, on this. So if you want to get the link, you can have it, and then you can refer back to it uh, over time. And I think this is one of these sessions where you may not uh, comprehend everything that's said, but over time, these different aspects will become uh, become important in a way of learning about grasses. Um, so what are the hints? We're going to talk about the flowers. We're going to talk about uh, what grasses are, flowering plants. We're going to talk about the inflorescence and that screen there you can see a lot of different inflorescence. That is how the how the flowers in a grass uh, reveal themselves. Uh, the next thing is diaspores. This is the, the part of the grass that spreads contains the seeds and things like awns, etc. So how those things spread and, uh, and, and turn into new plants. Different seasons, so obviously grasses have a seasonal pattern. Uh, habitats, so some grasses like wet areas, some like dry, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. C3 and C4, which a lot of you will have heard about, no doubt, but we'll touch on that. And then just a general thing on tax taxonomy, which looks a bit complex, but it's just something to, to know about. Then we'll just talk about a few ex uh, examples or quite a few examples of the different uh, of, of the different grasses. What we're not gonna cover, in, uh, I guess, is growing and managing grasses. So grasses are flowering plants. And here you can see on the left-hand side, uh, a flower, which is obviously recognized. It's got a lot of petals. Now, when you look inside the, uh, the, the flower, it has, the male and sexual, uh, male and female sexual uh, parts. So on the left or around the edge, you can see filaments or the anthers, they're the male parts. And then the, the, the stigma, the style and the ovary are all the female parts of the plant. The next, uh, the, the next slide, and I can't actually point to these, um, but, you, but you can see that he, here's a grass, the top of the grass plant with the, the anther, the male part, the stigma on, on top of the style, the female part. And the outside of that is a lemma, a lemma, lemma I should say, in palea. Um, and they're like, they're like the petals of the flower, uh, if you like. And at the bottom uh, right, we've got a, a grass in flower. So you can see both the male and female parts. So when grasses are flowering, we call this anthesis. Um, so here are examples of grasses in flower and you can see uh, the male parts in a lot of them and the male and female parts uh, in, other, in others. And this of course is an important way to start to understand different types of grasses and how to, how to identify them. Then we talk about the inflorescence. So as I said, this is the, the whole of the, of, of the flowering parts uh, of the grass. So there are different inflorescences. And obviously you can only see these when, when the grasses are, are in flower. And other times, of course, we've got to identify them by, by other means. But there are a number of examples. Um, now, 
a lot of people think grasses are not particularly interesting, but I find grass inflorescence is striking, not only for its beauty and diversity, but also for its complexity. So I hope you have that, or start to develop that same enthusiasm uh, that I have. There are more examples of inflorescence. Now, the example on the bottom uh, right-hand cor corner, this is a sort of uh, things that you find in textbooks about the, the different ways you can describe an inflorescence, whether it's raceme, uh, a panicle type or a spike uh, type. So as you get into it, so these sort of terms are, are helpful. Now we now talk about the dispora or the grass seed uh, dis dispersal. Now, here are examples of a number of, of different grasses. Uh, the bottom left, that's, that's um, kangaroo grass, and it's got a, a spear-like uh, seed, and an awn comes off the top. It actually has two awns, a very short one and a longer one. Um, the one on the top right is, uh, is a common spear grass that we find uh, around, uh, around here. I've put in weeping grass that someone was talking about before we uh, be, before we started. Um, Tillian needle grass, which Joe will talk about later, and then wallaby grasses, which have quite a distinct um, uh, dispora. So, so there are all ways in which again you can just identify grasses from uh, this part of the grass. An interesting thing about grasses is is the way that they that they grow, and a lot of grasses have these uh, horns and when they're dry, they're twisted. And so what happens, the grasses are being scattered, they're lying around on the ground. And when, the wet, uh, when, when they get wet, um, they start to unwind. And it's quite interesting to, uh, to watch this and some of you might have seen it, but then the grass stands upright and it starts to drill its way uh, into the ground. So if you, um, if we have a chance to look at that, that's something that's worth uh, worthwhile doing. Now, here's a, uh, the first complex slide, if you like. Um, and this was developed quite, quite recently by a, a couple of, um, of doctoral uh, students. So what they're trying to do here is just to tell us, okay, this is, Different, this is one way you can look at grasses. So if you look at the, um, well, what they've described as the awn uh, typology. So the, so on the, each of those grass seeds you can see there, there is the seed and coming away from that is the awn. Um, and the awn can be um, just a straight awn. Uh, it can be curved or hooked. Uh, and that's what we call falcate. Um, and in that case, it can also look like a, a sickle. Geniculate, which comes from the Latin mean to bend the knee. Um, so you can be bent once or bent twice. Uh, and if it bends twice, it's called uh, bigeniculate. Then you can see uh, all the, the, the whole uh, different examples of grasses. And so you can take these examples and then once you start to understand the, 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 the yawns, um, some come out the top, some come out the side, uh, sometimes there are multiple awns, um, and then on the right you can start to see. All right, which category do they um, do they fit into? They're, so they're very the various genus. So this is a very useful way to distinguish different types of, of grasses. Um, some other characteristics about grasses: uh, the auricles and the and, and the nodes. So the auricles are, are the base of the leaf. The, that breaks away from that stem, and the pattern of that can be quite uh, can be quite different. And the, on the uh, right hand side, we've got two examples of nodes. So this is where the stem, the various parts of the stems of the grass join together. And in this case, we've got one that's white, so that makes that a bit unusual. And the next one is uh, sorghum, it has like a ballerina skirt. And there's a few grasses that have this. So again, these are some of the ways you can do it. Going back to the oracles, you can also see some hair on some, not on others. You can see that oracle coming all the way around this, the, the blade and not on others. So when you start looking, reading about uh, grasses, 
these are ways in which uh, botanists help people to distinguish one uh, species or one plant uh, one, uh, or one genus from another. So here we jump into some of the, if you pick up a book on grasses, you will find, um, you will find an, an example uh, like this. So there's the whole grass plant. Um, and, and then there are the different parts of the grass. So there's the seed head, go down to the ligule, which is uh, then explained further. The ligule is that actually a, a bit behind the stem. Um, sometimes they come up like a, a membrane, sometimes they're hairy and sometimes they're absent. Um, the next part, the, the oracles, which I've just, uh, just described. So they can be claw-like or short or stubby or absent, and they can be other things uh, as, uh, as well. So I won't go into the other things, but they're the sorts of things uh, you can start to pick up about grasses. And quite often what someone will do, you get two grasses look pretty similar, and then they'll, they'll pick up one of these things and say, well, no, notice this is different to that one. And that's how you might tell uh, different um, species uh, apart. And if you're into art, I drew these many years ago, but sometimes if you just sit down and try to draw these structures, this is a very good way to, um, to, to learn about them. I just wanted to put in something to show that I can actually draw sometimes. Um, now we talk about the habits and habitats of grasses. And these slides are all of kangaroo grass, um, which is one of my favorites. So the bottom left is kangaroo grass in winter. And it can, it can fade away almost to uh, nothing, particularly if it's grazed. But kangaroo grass changes through the seasons. Um, it can be a bright green. It can then turn to a, a, a reddish brown um, color. So you've got to be aware of what, what these plants do um, through, the, through the seasons. And of course, they also respect, respond to wet and dry seasons. Uh, and here are some examples of, of native grasses. Um, wallaby grasses, uh, for example, in the top left slide, these tend to be small grasses and they like, um, they, they like dry, generally dry conditions. So they're much better on hillsides and things like this. There's two examples of um, spear grass there, tall spear grass on the top, top right and short spear grass. Tall spear grass tend to like slightly damper conditions than short spear grass. Um, spear grasses are not, are not amongst my favorite, but they tend to colonize areas where the other grasses have disappeared. And that's another feature about grasses. Some are colonizers and some are slow and steady um, and need more time to, to take over. Another common native grass is snow grass, uh, river tussock whatever, which is in the middle there. And the slide on the bottom is just a whole heap of different grasses that happen to be growing there. So things that affect grass are aspect, the slope, whether they like sun or shade, how will they compete, uh, whether they prefer wet or dry temperature, what sort of temperature they're, they're prepared to accept in the soils. Now here we jump into the C3, C4 grasses and the number of characteristics that they have. So C3 grasses are generally thought of as winter, as, as winter grasses or cool climate grasses. C4 are thought of as uh, more tropical grasses. Now, so most of the grasses that grow naturally around here are, C, are C3, but things like uh, kangaroo grass and some of the other grasses that we get are C4. Uh, and C3, C4 just stands for the different uh, carbon pathways that they have. So all plants have a C3 pathway, uh, but some have developed this C4 pathway. So just C3, we, if you think of them as cool as cool grown grasses, so they're cool season or all year long. Uh, light requirements are, are, are lower, temperature requirements are lower, but they require more moisture. The uh, lower sensitivity to frost um, feed quality is generally better and production is lower than some of the other grasses. So I won't go through the C4 grasses, but you can see the, uh, the different ways of uh, looking at them. And then I have some examples there of different ones. So uh, wheats and things uh, are C3s and then things like kangaroo grass 
uh, and other tropical grasses to see for. Um, yeah, why is that? Sorry, slide stuck. Ooh. My screen's frozen for some reason. Not much good. Sorry, I was on. I was on mute, Jeff. Do you, do you want to um, have a have another go or? Um, Sorry, I'm on, not on mute. Yeah, but oh, uh, I was sorry. Yeah, the screen has the screen has frozen. Okay, oh, so no, that's all right. Let's come back. Let's come uh, back. There you right. go. Now, cool. look, this this particular slide, most people just go, "My God, what's that?" But what it is, this is a, a very useful way of understanding evolution of grasses. So right around the outside are all the different uh, families of grasses. But what it what it shows is that it just shows how all the grasses um, are, are related. So if you spend time looking at that, you can then try to work out what grasses are related uh, related to what. So that sort of thing is it's, it's often referred to as cladistics and the bits in it are called clades. Um, so when you're looking at, um, just no, I can't quite see, see this, but um but if you just take one uh, uh one grass i mean they've got many we tend to talk of grasses being in um well, grass is a family then there's uh tribes uh or subfamilies tribes uh, at, at, at and so on but i won't spend too much time on that but it's something worth looking at in your own spare time oh, it's done it again oh no it's all right now look, I put this slide in just for reference for people. Uh, these are some of the different uh, grasses and some of their characteristics. So I don't want to spend time on, on this one. Now we jump jump into some of the, the family. So uh, the subfamily of, um, sorry, I should have said before, grasses are, uh, are a family and then they break down into about 12 subfamilies. Uh, the first one is, Poidae, and these tend to have the spear grasses in them. Uh, so we talked about tall and long spear grass um, there, uh, but they also have things like Chilean needle grass and sorry, Chilean needle grass, um, serrated tussock, which Joe will spend much, will spend more time uh, talking about. And then there's some other examples of some of our native uh, spear grasses, some of which you can see that one on the right hand side. That's quite a a spectacular grass and the other one on the left is something that grows two meters tall so um you know again they're, they're pretty impressive uh i'll sorry there are examples of serrated tussock and uh and chilean uh needle grass uh, and joe's going to talk more about those so then you've got the the brome family and, and there you know people are familiar with wheat brome grass barley uh uh no doubt some of the native grasses that, that go into there is, uh, there's only one that I'm familiar with and that's common wheatgrass, which is shown in those slides on the right hand side. Then the oats family. Um, and again, there's a lot of, uh, lot of uh, non-native grasses uh, in that lot. And then some uh, native grasses um, as well, which are things like, these ones and one i really like is swamp wallaby grass because you find that growing in in, in water it's probably more a, a pleasing grass just to observe rather than for any serious purposes but there's some of the uh some of the other grasses so one thing i'm not talking about is the nutritional value of some of these grasses and obviously another thing one needs to learn from uh for all sorts of reasons is what nutritional values that they that they have um and then the, uh, the uh, Poe family, um, and this consists of a lot of introduced as well as a lot of uh, native grasses. So there are things like uh, Bulpia, perennial rye, tall fescue, breeza, and coxfoot. Someone was asking about coxfoot uh, before. So the two, slide, uh, two pictures on the right are coxfoot. And then these are some of the native grass. And the one probably more familiar with um, 
which is quite common, is this uh, river tussock or, or what we call uh, snow grasses. And then there's a number of pictures of the inflorescence that I happen to um, haven't had, but there's a number of species, like with all these uh, genuses, there's a number of species of them. Uh, and here's some more, these, um, these, these are the uh, Power Siberiana, um, and they can be quite colorful. They're more gonna be in the high country. A couple of uh, introduced ones, uh, Power Annua at the top, which is also called winter grass or annual power, and then Kentucky bluegrass, which um, is quite commonly seen uh, around, uh, around this area. Then we get on to the um, Pinacordiaidae uh, tribe, um, and, within, and within that one, we have um, things like kangaroo grass and wild sorghum. So all the sorghums uh, come, into, come into here. Uh, so there are examples of, of kangaroo grass there. And then we go into these other, these are, and are all native ones. Um, so you get barbed wire grass, which is not uncommon around here, but the, the inflorescence looks like barbed wire. So that's where it gets its name from. Uh, and that's it at the bottom as well. Red spear grass, which, which is a colonizing grass, which you see everywhere around. Uh, so that's picture in the middle and the two below it. Um, so it can get, grows quite well. And um, a lot of pastoralists think it's great, others don't like it. And then wild sorghum, which is, uh, uh, is a grass that uh, animals like to eat, but they tend to, to eat it out. So that's a picture of that one there. And then um, these are these are some others. Uh, no, no. Yeah, sorry, part of my screen is, is hidden, but Kentucky bluegrass is the one on the left. And then mat grass is the one on the right. Mat grass likes very wet uh, conditions. Kentucky bluegrass is not uncommon around here. And mat grass you often find in, in swampy type areas. And then, um, the things, uh, well, hairy panic is a quite one, quite a common one, which we saw the other day, which you'll see on the weekend. And uh, paspalum, not one of my favourite grasses. Uh, that was the first grass I ever identified as a kid, and I hated it because it was sticky. And then we get on to the uh, Danthonia family, or Rhytidosperma, uh, Rhytidosperma uh, species. These are the wallaby grasses. Um, that seed head is quite unusual but and I'd like to have had time just to talk a bit about that but I I won't do that otherwise I'll go late but there look they're examples often called white tops because uh, it starts out as that green color on the bottom left and then uh, as it ages it turns white um, quite a quite a useful grass and then uh, red ant wallaby grass which is in that group has these brilliant uh, red uh, flowers on it and then the, the, some of the others that we've got, uh, nine on grass, which is shown, shown there, wheelmill grass, uh, um, that's quite, quite common. Um, Sprobolus, I love that grass just because of the name and the, uh, the native one tends to uh, have gaps uh, in the inflorescence coming up the stalk and the introduced ones uh, don't. And then, Oh, we've got the love grasses. Um, so there's quite a lot of native love grasses, um, but then there's the horror such as uh, African, African love grass. So if we had time, we could talk about how you distinguish between them. And then um, purple wire grass, not a particularly impressive grass, but we'll see examples of that on Sunday. And then uh, Microlina, a fantastic grass, um, likes water. Uh, will dry out quickly, but then I always describe this grass, if you're walking past it and it's looking dead, just spit on it and it will it'll turn green. That's its response to water is quite amazing. And it's very, it's great. We've got it growing in our, uh, in, in on our block of land here and it acts like a, a fantastic lawn. Okay, so there's huge number of resources on, uh, on grasses. One one I'd recommend is on the bottom left-hand side. This is camera nature map. And if you go on there and look at grasses, they've got examples of 
all the grasses that you'll find around here and they've got different pictures so that you can you can start to uh, distinguish grasses. Uh, we and friends of grasslands uh, sell woodland flora and grassland flora. They've got a, a lot of examples of grasses. And, and then the, I guess the Bible is the grasses of, of New South Wales. But look, there are just lots of books uh, on this and they're all they're all pretty good. OK, well, I think I've actually finished a bit early, but I guess uh, Alex, you're not going to object to that. So, yeah. No, no, thanks, Jack. But um, I'm sure we'll tease out the differences between the um, love grasses um, you know, through through what Joe's got to say, and then perhaps invite you to come back in on on discussing yep. that as well at the end. Yeah. Um. So that that's wonderful. Thanks so much. Um. I'll, I'll get you to sharing. to stop your share if that's okay. Yep. Perfect. Um, Thanks. Thanks so much. Um. So Joe, I'll invite you to join us and to jump in and share your screen, please. Okay. Uh, and I might just say too, while you're doing that, Joe, that um, if you're thinking that um, the, the presentations perhaps are a little bit overwhelming, a bit too much to remember, um, I just wanted to let you know that they will be on our website so you don't have to remember all of that detail. So that's a really lovely resource that you're going to be able to, to tap in after this web, tap into after this webinar. Thanks, Joe. All right, thanks, Alex. You can hear me okay? Yeah, that's come through loud and clear. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. And um, first of all, thank you to the Small Farms Network and the committee and to the Alex for organising this evening um, and inviting me to come along and speak with you. Um, I'm based uh, down here on the Monero in the Garrigo country, um, having a phenomenal season like many others are. Um, but with phenomenal seasons also have huge weed growth that we're managing as well. So Alex has asked me to go through this evening some of the more um, introduced pasture species that we manage up here on the tablelands and some of the key threats to our pasture systems up here being our perennial grass weeds. All right, so just quickly where I'm gonna to head tonight uh, with this talk, we'll look at the introduced grass species and as I said, the perennial grass weeds. I'm gonna sort of highlight a few key points as I go along. Um, these are some of the tips and tricks that I'm looking for when I'm out in the paddock looking at grasses. Um, Jeff's covered a whole myriad of grasses already. Um, and if you're starting to feel a bit boggled in the head about all these different plants, we've all started there. Um, and I'll keep saying it again and again, the more time you spend in the paddock with these grasses, the more familiar and comfortable you get with them and you get used to how they vary with the seasons. So um, but there are some little tips that we can provide to you to help you with that that education. Um, I'll touch on a few resources that are around as well to help you um, get more familiar and, and educated about your grasses that you're managing. All right, so the, the main pasture species that we are working with up in the tablelands um, in the introduced space are our Coxfoot, Phalaris, Fescue and Ryegrass, um, all temperate species that we are managing. We also have to partner with these grasses are some introduced clovers. Um, and I'll only just briefly touch on those tonight. <clears throat> um, it is worth mentioning that people certainly so introduce pastures for a reason um, that comes at a cost and with certain risks, but at the end of the day, they can provide you know, a fairly medium to high quality feed base for your uh, livestock production. And they can also provide fairly you know, high quality and quantity of feed. So the bulk of feed in your paddock as well. But you do it for a very specific reason. And at the end of the day, it's not a set and forget type of pasture option. You do need to manage these pastures. They are designed for systems that have higher nutrients than most of our soils in, in Australia, um, and they require grazing management as well. So you do have to work with them once you've got them. Alrighty, so look, first of all, I'll touch on Coxfoot. Um, Jeff mentioned C3 and C4 grasses before um, in his, his first presentation. And I refer to them as temperate and tropical because that's the preferred environments that they like to grow in. Um, so Coxfoot is what we call a temperate grass, um, typically germinates in that autumn period, um, pokes along through winter, flourishes in spring, but when it starts getting too warm in summer, it tends to shut down. It doesn't cope well in warm temperatures. 
um, a bit like me really. So that's the style of the life cycle of, of, of these grasses. The tip that I tell with people who are trying to identify cocks in the paddock, it's very easy to get it confused with phalaris, is follow the leaf down to the base of the plant. If it's folded at the base, it is probably coxfoot. They have a folded um, leaf coming out of the base of the plant. It opens up once it gets out, but it is always folded at the base. <clears throat> the panicle, as you can see on the left-hand side here, is a branched one. So it's always got branches coming off the main stem. Um, and if you think about the word coxfoot, as in a rooster, um, you can see, or use your imagination, there's the, the foot of the, the rooster or the cock um, and his little spur on the back of his foot. So hence the name cock's foot. It's a branched panicle. And the interesting thing with this one is it's actually not, I guess, cylindrical. So it's not a what I call a 3D panicle. On one side, there's lots of these little florets that sit out. If you flip it over, as you can see on this photo here on the right, um, it's actually, it's quite bare on the top half of the panicle. Um, and that's a very unique characteristic to coxfoot, which can help you identify if you've got a seed head. This species is incredibly tough. Um, I've seen it grow on the most acidic soils with incredibly high aluminium contents. So it is an absolute you know, workhorse of a plant that can cope in very tough situations. Um, a few producers don't like it because it can actually make your paddocks very bumpy to drive over, particularly if you've got the old coxfoots. Um, but some of the newer coxfoots that have been bred and released have got much smaller, uh, I guess, tussock base areas and have got much finer leaf. So um, there's been a lot of work done in the coxfoot space. Moving on to phalaris. Um, look, this, this plant, again, is an absolute workhorse of our pasture industry. It's another temperate grass. So again, doesn't like the high temperatures of summer that can grow quite happily if the conditions allow for it at the rest of the time of the year. I mentioned that the coxfoot is folded at the base, well, phalaris is rolled. So again, follow the leaf down to the base of the plant. And as it comes out of the ground and the leaf emerges, it is, it is rolled. It's a really easy trick to distinguish between the two. The panicle here for the phalaris is contracted. And unlike the coxfoot, the phalaris one is three-dimensional, as in you know, the seeds that are on that panicle go all the way around the entire seed head. So it's a nice, easy one to identify if you've got a seed head on the plant. The phalaris um, can be highly productive, but it is not as tolerant, I think, of challenging conditions as coxfoot. Um, it does prefer a more neutral soil pH, um, sometimes a little bit more rainfall, but it really will not tolerate soils with high aluminium content um, and low pHs. Um, there has been a line of phalaris bread that is more acid tolerant. Um, it was bred by the CSIRO. Again, sometimes it can be hard to get. And if you're managing really acidic soils, um, you've also got to think about getting your clovers into the system as well. So um, it's, it's one to keep in mind if you're trying to manage acid soils as being a, possibly a problem. All right, one that I'm seeing a fair bit of at the moment um, is fescue, another temperate C3 grass. It's, um, it's an interesting one. It is a bit like phalaris in the fact that it is, has a rolled leaf as it comes out of the base. Um, the leaf on these plants can be very broad at times. Um, it's, when you see them side by side, they're quite a different plant to look at. The panicle is very different to a phalaris seed head though. It's that open branch panicle again that we talked about earlier. The leaves, the fescue plants um, differ from phalaris because they have these deep veins on them. And they can often be quite shiny on the underside as well. Um, if you do see them, they are quite different to phalaris. And the reason I said that I'm seeing a fair bit of it at the moment is because we tend to see phalaris perform better in years with higher rainfall, or we find it in the paddock in areas where there's more soil moisture. So in soaks, drainage lines, and around dams and wet areas. So um, it, it finds its niche in the landscape. Um, finding niches in a landscape, well, here's a whole paddock at Teralga um, with a very productive fescue pasture sown into it. So they don't all look big and clumpy. This one's actually been well managed, well raised and well fertilised. Um, and it's actually looking a bit like a really nice backyard lawn. <laughs> I might be thrilled to have that at my place. So again, very productive pasture, that one. And then finally onto ryegrass. Um, again, another one of our temperate C3 grasses. 
This one I find quite easy to identify. You don't always need seed heads, um, but it's important to I guess, first note that this is a grass that has had massive amount of breeding over the years. Um, it's genetically very interesting to look at, um, but from your perspective as a land manager, it actually has two different life forms. There's a perennial type and an annual type. Um, the annual type is your annual love grass, oh, sorry, your annual ryegrass in that it germinates, grows, seeds and dies in the space of 12 months. The perennial ones don't live forever. Um, if they're well managed, you can get, draw them out for sort of four or five years um, and then you tend to lose them out of your pasture. Incredibly productive grasses. But the easiest way to identify them is the leaves are really shiny. Um, it's a really distinct grass because of that shiny leaf, usually quite soft as well. And then you've got the the lovely hay fever inducing spikelet panicle. Um, for those of us who suffer hay fever, you will know what I mean. Um, when it's ryegrass season, you reach um, for your hay fever tablets. It's, it's just hand in hand. Um, that aside, it is still a phenomenally impressive grass to have um, if you're after productivity in your pastures. Quite like fescue, um, the ryegrasses do perform better under high rainfall and higher soil fertility. Um, again, just the nature of how they've been bred to perform. Um, so if you are thinking about going down the path of using ryegrasses, um, you do need to have them to fit into your management systems if you are managing a more fertile productive system. Just to now touch on, I guess, the two primary clovers that we rely on in our temperate pasture systems. Um, the first one being subterranean clover. Um, it's, again, a foundational clover for us in our pastures. And the easiest way to tell the difference between the subterranean clover and our white clover um, is ideally you've got flowers. Um, the white clover has these little soccer ball like flowers that sit up on stalks above the ground and subterranean clover, like its name suggests, actually has its flowers um, and its seed buried into the ground, subterranean. The way I tell the difference, if I don't have flowers, if the leaves are fuzzy and hairy, Think of a hairy-nosed wombat that likes bulldozing through the ground. This subterranean clover will do the same if you give it the chance to. So it's really hairy and fuzzy, it's subterranean clover. If the hair, if the leaflets don't have any hair on them, then it's likely to be white clover. Really simple one to distinguish. And of course, if you've got clovers, that's fantastic. But unless they have these little nodules, like on the picture on the right-hand side here, and if those nodules are not pink on the inside, they're just basically the clovers themselves are a fancy looking grass. They need to have nodules and they need to be pink on the inside to be fixing nitrogen for you. Um, again, really important part of having nitrogen in your system to help your grasses grow successfully as well. And you'll find these nodules on a lot of native legumes as well. So it's always interesting to dig up native legumes and see how their nodules are looking. Again, noted here, these are temperate style grasses, uh, grasses and clovers. So they have a window of when they like growing. And if it's below five degrees or above 27 degrees, they tend to just shut down because they can't cope with those systems. Whereas the more tropical grasses can continue growing above that 27 degree cap. All right, so moving on to our wonderful perennial grass weeds. Um, these are sort of the, the trifecta that we are dealing with down on the Monero. Um, and they all sort of have their own unique areas that we tend to have more of a problem with them. Um, but I'll go through them um, bit by bit. But we've got serrated tussock, African love grass, and Chilean needle grass. And you'll notice that um, if you look at the botanical names on the bottom, that serrated tussock and Chilean needle grass are both nacella species. So they're actually related to each other. Um, and Erigrostis is its own kind of special weed. <laughs> All right, so firstly, serrated tussock. I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with it, um, either on your own places or in your travels around the district. Um, you know, as all weeds are, it's highly invasive. The thing with serrated tussock, which actually makes it such a problematic weed, is that animals really struggle to digest the, the plant once they consume it. It tends to bind up in their gut and not break down. So you could have an animal die of starvation being on serrated tussock and it dies with a full gut, but it's all serrated tussock that it cannot digest. Um, as you can see in the photo here, every bit of purple haze through the paddock is all seeding serrated tussock. So it really does get a run on once it gets going. 
The leaves of serrated tussock are a bit like their name. They're serrated to the touch. Some people can feel the serrations just by running their hand up the leaves and the tussock. Um, the real trick is if you try and run your fingers down very carefully, um, you'll feel the serrations more on your way down to the base of the plant. Um, but they are very sharp, so be careful. If you don't have the seeding plant, it's not nice and obvious again. This is one of the things that Jeff mentioned earlier, is little characteristics on the plants that we can use to help identify them. And serrated tussock has this little hairless ligule. I sort of think about it as the, the, the collar on the back of your shirt. Um, that your leaf comes off and the collar sits there once you pull the leaves apart. And for a serrated tussock plant, it doesn't have any hairs around that ligule with a lot of other pasture grasses do have that. Unfortunately though, serrated tussock um, is really good at hiding in plain sight. Um, and it can grow quite successfully next to other poetussic plants. Um, and it's sometimes, the, particularly coming out of winter, the lime green sort of look of the, the serrated tussock can make it look just like a corkscrew or a stiper, ostrich stiper plant. Um, so they can be very easy to confuse at certain times of the year. Again, this is just another paddock um, of serrated tussock down at Bombala. You can see some very big, mature seeding serrated tussocks. But there are still some big, very healthy poa tussocks through the paddock, along with some of our stifers and wallaby grasses. So again, it's a native grassland that's been, um, I guess, invaded, not completely overrun, but it's on its way, um, all due to serrated tussock. All right, moving on to its uh, cousin, Chilean needlegrass, very different looking plant. Um, and the reason that we are concerned about Chilean needlegrass is that it's a really nasty seed. Um, so it actually not only contaminates the wool, but it can actually pierce the skin of an animal. Um, so we actually get carcass contamination. Um, and then from the day-to-day -day perspective, you see it up around the face and the eyes of animals. Um, and it can get very nasty. The leaves of this plant often give it away. Um, again, we, grass identification is tricky because you don't always have seed heads. Um, the leaves on this plant, when you see them, and I'll bring some along on the weekend as well, but the leaves are quite hairy. Um, and once you get to again, spend time with these plants, you do pick it up when you start to, to walk through the paddocks and, and look at what's in front of you. Um, the leaves also have a very distinct um, leaf venation on each leaf of the leaves as well. What makes chili needlegrass really stand out when it does have a, a flower head or a panicle on it? is that the glooms, um, I guess the, the bit where the, before the awn comes out of the seed, are purple um, and it's really quite distinctive. Um, once you pull a seed out of the plant, there's this little distinct characteristic which makes it look different than sphere grasses. And that's this little crown, what's called a corona, um, at the base of the awn. And the sphere grasses don't have this little crown, the Chilean needlegrass does. So that's a nice easy way to check um, if it is Chilean needlegrass. Obviously, if it is, don't go throw the seed on the ground afterwards. But unfortunately, you know, it, this plant does resemble corkscrew and other spear grasses. Um, and occasionally I was, I was spraying a paddock the other day with Chilean needlegrass in it, and it was hiding in amongst wallaby grass, which can also have a bit of a hairy leaf at times. So it was testing my ability to be able to distinguish and, and just spray the needlegrass. Here's a nice big patch of it, um, blowing in the wind as it does. And you can see those real, really distinct purple glooms um, on these plants. They can get quite tall. Um, I've seen them probably at the height of a metre um, with their flowering panicles. Uh, other times I've seen them you know, producing seed at a very low level. Um, and this plant can also produce seeds at the base of the plant. It's called a basal seed. It's quite interesting, um, but we don't see a lot of it, thankfully. And moving on to the grass I've spent way too much time working on recently, um, and that's African love grass. So unlike the Chilean needle grass and the serrated tussock, African love grass is a summer active or a tropical grass, um, and it's perennial as well. So this is a grass that can cope in much warmer conditions where the other grass is shut down. Um, but reverse of that, when winter hits, this grass shuts down. It cannot cope with the cold weather. So for us on the Monero, um, we basically have, you know, many months of the year where this grass provides zero feed to our pasture systems um, because it's just not able to contribute. 
the grass itself, again, is highly competitive. Um, there's been some work done over the years looking at how to suppress weeds like serrated tussock from germinating. And, and the work that Warwick Badgery and co did um, tended to sort of find that, you know, if you can keep your ground cover at sort of 80%, you've got a pretty good chance of suppressing things like serrated tussock. Unfortunately, African love grass is incredibly tough. I've seen it germinate um, and poke its head out through a foot of mulch um, just to get to the sunlight. So it is a very impressive plant, um, but also a very frustrating one to try and, and manage um, as a pastoralist. And then to add to that, again, if you spend more time with these love grasses, you actually start realizing that they, some of them look a bit different in different parts of the area. Um, and that's because there are quite a few different biotypes. So there's still African love grass, there's still Aerogrostis curvula, but there's lots of different tiny variations um, within the African love grass species. Um, and we're looking into, you know, are there, what these different characteristics can mean. Um, and we're also looking into herbicide resistance within African love grass and serrated tussock as well. So that's one of my big projects at the moment. For African love grass, look, when it's not looking like this photo, um, the leaves of the plant are generally more blue green in colour. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Um, if you see them side by side with your stiper grasses or your corkscrews, you can start distinguishing based on a bit of colour. And the other characteristic I find is that the older leaves start developing a nice little corkscrew or curl at the leaf tip, um, and that can be quite handy to identify it. Um, unfortunately, we have plenty of native love grasses, as Jeff mentioned, um, and these species can often get misidentified. Um, and hairy panic, I've also heard compared to as well as a similar species. This is the panicle of African love grass. Um, the way I've heard it best described is that it can take on a Christmas tree um, or that sort of pyramid appearance. Um, and to show you what I mean, <laughs> that's the best I could come up with. Um, it really takes on that, that really sort of trapezi trapezoid shape um, and can look like a Christmas tree when it's mature and open. And this is the classic problem when you first get a love grass infestation is where on earth do you find it in the paddock? And no, the dog's name is not Wally. Um, this is how love grass creeps in. You get a few plants, they shed a few seeds, and you get small patches start developing. Again, spending time in the paddock, you start to look for certain characteristics. And in this sort of paddock, which is full of wallaby grasses and spear grasses, the love grass heads all sit at a certain height within the pasture, and they're dark in colour. Um, and that's how we were picking up on these little sporadic infestations in this paddock, this is up towards rocky plains. You know, put the dog next to it and the seed head is you know, easily past her head height. Um, and again, it just blends in beautifully. So side by side, this is what you're looking at. You're out there trying to do your management, whether you're spraying or chipping out these plants, how do you tell the difference? You know, which plant, on the, is on the right, which plant is on the left, which one are you actually going to target and try and manage? Um, so based on this characteristics I just mentioned, the plant here on the left has slightly bluer, greenier foliage, and you can actually see some of these older leaves starting to get that curl. So the plant on the left is African love grass, the plant on the right is our corkscrew or our ostress diaper. So again, you just start getting your eye and you just spend more and more time with your pasture grasses. So you've got lots of different grasses. You've probably got some perennial grass weeds. Who are you going to try and you know, contact to get more advice and help? Um, and look, the obvious go-to places are people um, like your local council who has biosecurity officers, vegetation officers, weed management officers. Um, they're sort of your, your, your original go-to people. Um, but having said that, you know, local land services staff can often also be a really good resource, um, either through the agricultural staff, biosecurity or NRM staff. We've all got a fair amount of exposure and experience with these grasses now. There's also some other great resources out there. Um, the land care networks um, and their staff, as well as other natural resource management agencies are fantastic resources. Um, land for Wildlife is a really great one as well. Um, like Jeff, I'm gonna give a really good plug for the Canberra Nature Map. It is a fantastic resource. Um, that I start, I've been using more and more in recent times. It's a wonderful database of plants and pictures. And finally, um, paddock walks, you know, whether it's one like those of you who are coming along on Sunday um, or just spending time with someone in your area walking through your paddock and discussing the grasses. 
Um, I always encourage landholders to drop off a bouquet of grass seeds or weeds or whatever they can find in their paddock that they want to know about. Um, I get into my office and I find bouquets of these plants on my desk. Um, and I encourage that because that's a great way for people to, to learn. And it's also great for me to, to keep up to speed with what people are concerned about in their paddocks. So um, utilise the resources that are out there. We've got a lot more than we used to have. And then Alex also asked me just to touch on sort of the main resources that I um, utilise or refer to people. Um, for those of you trying to manage weeds, um, not just your perennial grass weeds, but weeds in general, the um, New South Wales Weedwise um, is a app, but it's also an online website. Um, it is a fantastic resource for plant identification, but it also provides all your control options. So it lists all your currently registered herbicides, um, as well as your other management tools that you've got up your sleeve. So have a look at that one. Uh, we also um, use quite frequently this Grasses of the Tablelands book, which was put together by the Department of Primary Industries. Um, it's a book that just focuses on grasses that you'll find in the Tablelands, so northern, central and southern. Um, really great book with some great pictures, identification tips and some management advice. Um, uh, as far as other past resources go, um, Tocal produces the Ag Guide series, and there's a, quite a few books on pastures, um, weed identification, weed management in that, that series. Um, but they also produce, for those of you that are a bit more techie, um, some ebooks as well. Um, and you can access those through the Tocal website. Um, and there's some really interesting ones in there for those of you that have got that sort of more tablet orientated um, resource in front of you. And if you're looking for a good old fashioned website, then the DPI Pastures and Rangelands um, website's also a really good one to go to. So look, that's just a quick snapshot, I guess, of some of the key grasses, the perennial grass weeds that are causing us so many headaches, um, some tips to try and identify and differentiate between them. Um, but really, I can just encourage you all to spend more time out in your paddocks um, or other people's paddocks or even along the roadsides and just, just get used to what's around you and, and learn as you go. Um, I'm still learning every single day about different grasses and different characteristics. It's never ending. Um, but like Jeff said, it is really fascinating once you get into this space. So don't be daunted. <laughs> um, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'll get you to stop your share if that's okay. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Wonderful. I think you might be on mute again, Joe, if you want to unmute yourself, because I'm going to start asking you some questions. Jeff, was there anything that you would like to add um, to Joe's present, don't, what, to what Joe said about distinguishing the African love grasses? Um, well, I think she covered and, and it. I, mean, grasses, I think she, had, uh, she covered it. Very well. I mean, as I tried to emphasize, uh, you can, as, as you learn how to identify the different parts of grasses, then this is a this is a big help. I mean, obviously, the difference between a spear grass and African love grass is when they're in when they're in flower, when they're in seed. I mean, you're not going to uh, a problem have a problem then. Uh, I have more problem perhaps trying to distinguish between. Uh, the small stiper and, and the um, serrated tussock, but yeah, no, and I think what's, I think uh, uh, Joe's general point is become familiar with these these grasses and what they can do uh, and, and what they can do for you. And the more you the more you learn, the more fascinating they be um, uh, they become. So yeah, sorry that was long winded answer. Yeah, all right. So I'll, I'll launch into some questions and then if we've got a bit of time, we've got a few um, here to ask as well. So this one's from, from Michael. Um, he'd like to grow seed native grasses, but have the perception that seeding native grasses is not particularly effective. Do you have any comment and suggestions for making it more effective? Uh Answer to, to this one, look, I, I think with a lot of native grasses, um, it just takes time and patience to learn about them. Now, we have a small block of land here in Ngunnawal in, in Canberra, and we have about 25 uh, different native grasses growing. 
and they seem to do uh, very well. But for a long time, we couldn't get them to grow. Maybe something has changed about the uh, about the soil, but but now they sort of like we keep pulling them out because they go, you know, we get we get too many of them and we give them away. So, you know, I think it, this is we'll take take up what Joe said. Get to know your grasses. Get, get talk to other people about what they uh, what they're doing. I've seen a lot of uh, farms, some beautiful patches of uh, uh, kangaroo grass and, and other things. So it's all it's all possible. But just finding that finding that way through is just it just takes some research and time. And the other thing too that we do is uh, is to use uh, seed seed orchards. So grow these grasses from seed in a small plot. And then you can collect more seed and, and get, go out from there. Once you once you start having uh, small plants that you've got, you can then start planting them, uh, start planting them out. And like any garden, I guess you just have to look after them until they establish. You know, and a lot of those grasses, I said, just sort of seem to grow wild in our place now. And um, the neighbours object because our place looks too weedy with grasses. Hmm. Yeah, I think you that. Yeah, the. The native grasses are really interesting um, from a seed harvesting perspective too. And it's really just a, it's an evolutionary thing that they have in the fact that the, the panicle um, as it develops matures at a different rate. Um, so you'll often find, you know, mature, you know, ripe seed um, at the tip of the plant. But at the base of the panicle, um, it's still developing. And that's just a insurance policy um, that the plants developed over time. But as someone who wants to go and harvest seed, um, that makes it quite a frustrating process because you can't just cut the panicle off and take the whole panicle and assume that it's all going to be ripe and viable. Yeah. Um, so I know guides that go back um, multiple times to the patches that they are trying to harvest seed um, and, and collect seed from the same plants multiple times as that panicle slowly develops and matures over time. Um, if you take it all at once, you'll end up with a whole lot of immature, unviable seed. So there's a, there's a technique and trick to doing it. So I think that um, the question was um, sort of directed a little bit to if there are any resources for people that might be wanting to uh, seed gra like native grasses, you know, um, to augment a pasture or to oversow or something to, like that. So Joe, do you know, if, is, there, is there any research done about um, seeding native grasses or establishing native grasses um, for pasture? Yeah, look, it certainly can be done. Um, I guess I will say that the most successful native pastures I've seen, you know, professionally sown as a pasture, mm. um, the process that's been followed to, to get to a successful native sown pasture has actually been almost identical to someone who goes through the process of sowing an introduced pasture. Um, the same principles apply that you need to have a, a weed-free base to work from. Um, so that the native grasses have very little competition when they're establishing themselves, germinating through to establishment. Um, and the management of keeping your know, stock off the paddocks so the plants can actually you know, develop a really good root system, um, as well as all their little leaf solar panels. Um, it's a very similar process if you want to go down that path. Um, at a different scale, you know, just scattering seed is certainly an option. Um, you're dealing with things like ant theft and lodging, if that's the case. But I know plenty of people who have, have harvested seed um, and just raked it um, across the surface of, of bare patches that they're trying to establish and have had pretty reasonable success. So it just takes a bit of fiddling around to find out what works for you. Right. What have you done, Jeff? Yeah, no, I, I agree. There's a, a guy called Paul Gibson Roy um, who's done a lot of research on uh, restoring native uh, grasslands and he, he scrapes the surface of the soil uh, exactly. away. And then he spreads the seeds of all sorts of things. And, and his things have been highly successful and they mm -hmm. include a lot of native grasses as, as well as a lot of uh, wildflowers. The thing is that this is a relatively new industry and the rewards are very high if you're successful, like, you know, the prices on, on native grass seeds are, are, very, uh, are very high. But, uh, and lots of, you know, Look, I know lots of situations where people say, I've got all this seed, you know, and um, normal times you come here, you could just take away a lot of microlina seed, for example. But then, you know, trying to match people who've got too much with people who want to buy, it's, it's, a, 
it's a very um, well, I'm an economist. It's, it's 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 a very bad it's a very bad market in that way. But you know, I'd certainly encourage people who are at all interested to start trying to do this because there is a market uh, for the you know for for these sorts of grass seeds uh in in Canberra and all the conservation work and other people a lot of and, and a lot of people who belong to this group no doubt are interested in doing this sort of thing as well mm. and Ian Chivers is also a good resource as well he um commercially produces a lot of this seed um and has written a, a book I guess a guidance book um as to how he most successfully establishes native grasses as well so he's based down in Victoria is he, um, still, is he still working? Is he still operating? Or not? I'm not sure. I haven't been he's in touch with him for just, many years. Yeah. In a couple, yeah, probably five years since I've, I've spoken with him. Yeah. But oh, he, what was his name, Joe? Ian Chivers. Okay. There is a book out that he's produced as well. I that's certainly still around. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent. So I think this one is directed to you, Joe. Um, can you talk about sweet vernal grass? <laughs> how to discourage stop from eating it and how to suppress it. I'm uh, okay. this answer. <laughs> um, look, it's, to be perfectly honest, it is not one that we really have to deal with much down the Monero. Um, we've got enough weed issues when it comes to grasses. Um, but look, I'm certainly aware it's, it's a bit of a problem north of us, um, heading up through that Goulburn and Highlands area. Um, if it is causing problems for you, um, I'd be looking to manage it as you would any grass weed. Um, yeah, the control options are fairly similar. Um, if you want to go down the herbicide path, grazing management is difficult with this plant. Um, so I think most people choose to, to live with it um, or to replace it, um, depending on what you're trying to do with it. Mm. It's very I'm just wondering if... if if this was sort of grass that you would slash as it comes, well, before it comes into seed, so you stop it from, from seeding. I mean, that would, that's a wild suggestion. That's the only way I can think of, because we had it on our property and it was just a, a pest, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of the grasses, you know, slashing can certainly buy you time. Um, I was looking at a, a paddock of African love grass the other day that was slashed um, after Christmas. And the slashing has had a really good suppression effect on the grass and it's not putting up a lot of seed heads yet, but all the red grass that is growing in amongst the love grass is having a field day. There are seed heads everywhere. Um, so strategic slashing can certainly be a, a management tool um, to sort of hold back the tide. The thing to remember with particularly things like love grass, um, nature finds a way and love grass is smart. If you slash the seed heads off the top, it'll just start putting them out at a level below the slash height. Um, just even walking around um, the, the laneway behind the office today where it gets mowed, the love grass was seeding parallel to the ground about an inch off the ground level. Um, all the top heads have been knocked off, but it's just found a way to still produce seed. Um, it's just not to be underestimated. Yeah, wonderful. So Jeff, is there a, um, a, it's not wonderful that it does that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I actually, when you were talking about um, the Chilean needle grass, I, I've, I have observed how they, they do send out those seed heads um, very quickly in response to being mown or, or slashed or whatever, and, and they generally are quite on quite short stalk, stalk. So they obviously have evolved to um, try and, uh, you know, reproduce as quickly and as efficiently as they can. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, Jeff, is there a key message about plant identification that you would like to share with the audience? Um, well, look, for my, for my part, so I belong to, to a group that lots of people like to identify plants uh, and grasses were particularly difficult. So I set myself this, you know, I, I started doing a lot of reading, reading all the sorts of literature that's, that's there and then trying to identify the different features uh, of grasses. Then I started to, to teach people about them um, as, uh, as well. Look, I, look, we have a lot of people come along to and start with us and they, I guess one way to do it is just to sort of, uh, as Joe said, just start to identify one or two grasses, become familiar with those and then you go on. And after a while you, you realize you know 10 grasses and it's 20 and then you start to, to, to sort of pick up the sorts of uh, hints I was talking about 
and, and then then you go around with Patty. Said, listen, I know I'm not good at this because uh, my partner and lots of people around me are, so I don't bother anymore. But you know, they're picking plants out and they're saying, no, no, it's not this because you, you see this pit, this bit of the plant here is, is different. So I think you just got to get started. Uh, I mm. think reading's good. I think the books that Joe was mentioning, some of those grass books about plant ID are fantastic. And just to get to know, just to get to know some. So, you know, as a six year old, I knew about Paspalum, but it took me a long time before I started identifying others. Sorry, mm. that's just a general answer, but I think it's patience and just don't, don't feel overwhelmed um, about yeah. this. Thank you. I'm sorry, the other thing I suppose is just being around people who know this stuff, um, yeah. you know, because you can learn so much from someone, you know, like, a, and I guess Sunday will be a good example, but uh, when, when someone sort of shows you something you never even thought about before, you know, this is, gets into your brain and then you start to see that uh, around, around you as well. Yeah, okay. And Joe. Um, how do you tell that grasses are at their best feed quality? Um, look, for us, it, it, we're managing pastures for livestock and that's mainly where I'm, I'm working in most of my space. Um, so the feed quality is, is really crucial um, for any animal that's reproducing or even just growing. Um, the general rule of thumb is, you know, if the grass is, is actively growing, pushing out young, fresh green leaf, um, that's a pretty good assumption that that's the best feed quality you're going to see from that plant. Um, the general process is once that plant matures, the leaves age and the plant hits reproductive mode, the general feed quality starts declining. Um, and, and that holds true for both temperate and tropical grasses, um, except the tropical grasses usually start about 10% on the feed quality curve behind the temperate grasses. So um, the digestibility and the quality of these feeds um, has massive animal production ramifications. Mm. Um, so I guess if people are wanting to learn more about it, I guess looking at that feed quality um, and management side of things, um, courses like ProGraze can be a really good way to, to tie that productivity and plant processes together really nicely. Yeah. yeah. Just a quick comment on that, a bit, bit, bit out of left field, but if you watch what your animals eat, they'll always go for the grasses that are fresher and they'll leave the, the they'll leave the, the the things that are um that are dead so i mean i totally agree with what joe's saying about you know when they're fresh and green like like anything else yeah yeah quality feed versus brussels sprouts um, or cardboard it's um if, if they're seeking you know feed to keep themselves going they'll they'll seek out the short good quality feed anytime yeah yeah okay well, um, everyone's been pretty well behaved and haven't asked too too many questions. We put them asleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're hungry or whatever, but um, maybe they need some nutrition themselves. But um, thank you so much. I I'm just going to share my screen very briefly just to wrap this all up and um, then we'll come back and, and say goodbye to everyone. So I'd just like to remind you if you could please uh, do the survey that will pop up at the end of this Zoom session, that would be wonderful. Your feedback helps us plan future events like this one um, and it's a really good way for you to tell us what works and what doesn't. So I'm, I'm very grateful to hear from you. Just wanted to let you know that we do have a, a discussion group on Facebook and that's a place where you can share, share your stories about your farm. You can ask questions. I post some information there um, that I don't necessarily put on our main Facebook page. It can be just articles that are interesting that I, that I find and you're also invited to do the same thing. Uh, this webinar will be put on our YouTube channel and if you've missed any of our past events, the webinars, and we have a collection of short videos as well on the YouTube channel, you, you can find lots of different uh, topics there from sheep to alpacas, chickens, raising chickens, 
um, acid soils workshops um, and a lot more in between climate change. So everything that we've, uh, we've been able to record is on our YouTube channel. And if you can't find that link, uh, you can go to our website and it, it, the link is on our website. So I just wanted to let you know about, remind you about the website and also our main Facebook page. That's the, bit, the way that we communicate with people. You can go to the Small Farms Network website page and you can join up for our free, free newsletter. You can also become a member uh, and membership costs $22 a year. And uh, members get early notification of workshops you're able to advertise in our, in our newsletter and also attend members only events. And I just wanted to let you know at the end of, uh, in, within the, the next week or so that I will write a workshop summary and I will publish this webinar and I will also share it with everyone who's registered for the webinar tonight. Uh, and that will include the presentations that Joe and Jeff have just given.